<laughs> All right, so that, let's kind of go over the bit, this big idea of angular momentum, the moment of inertia, and all that good stuff. So when you talk about moment of inertia, you have two things that influence this calculation, okay? Two things. You have the mass and the location of the mass. But if you're just talking about inertia, what's the only thing that affects inertia? Mass. Mass. Okay, that's it. Because the general idea, now listen to me, this is just the general overarching theme of moment of inertia. That is, that is I equals mR squared, okay? That forms the basis of all the other equations and how you calculate it based upon specific shapes. Thin hoop, solid sphere, hollow sphere, thin rods, whatever, okay? So, even though this forms the basis of it, you can only use this under two circumstances. You have a point mass or it's a thin hoop. And I would specifically have to tell you, this is a thin hoop, this is a point mass, okay? Otherwise, I'm going to tell you, oh, it's a solid sphere, like a golf ball. Or it's a hollow sphere, like a ping pong ball or a basketball, okay? I would have to specifically tell you what that is. And again, do not memorize them, okay? There's a couple of things. Either I will give you that equation in the test, or you're going to have it on the back of your equation sheet. So don't, I'm not going to expect you to have the equations memorized for the different types of moments of inertia, Okay? No, okay, I will either give them to you or they will be on your sheet. But here's the main idea. Since it's mR squared, what's going to make more of a difference in altering the moment of inertia? The amount of mass or the location of the mass? Okay, so because that's r squared, right? So if I double the radius, the moment of inertia is going to go up by a factor of 4, because it's r squared, right? So if I double the radius, moment of inertia goes up by a factor of four. But if I double the mass, moment of inertia goes up by a factor of two, okay? So any changes in radius are gonna be more pronounced in, in the calculation of moment of inertia than the changes of mass is gonna be. So it is possible for two objects to have unequal mass, but they could have the same moment of inertia. Okay, because of the fact that you have two factors, you have mass and you have radius, okay? But you cannot have two objects that have the same mass, excuse me, that have different mass that could have the same inertia, because inertia is only dependent upon mass. So since the moment of inertia is dependent upon two things, you can equalize them out between that ratio of mass and radius. You cannot equalize out things with inertia since that's only dependent upon mass. Okay, so if you look on your answer to number five, okay, you got a solid cylinder, you're going to use I equals one half mR squared, okay? Don't use mR squared because it's not a fan hoop and it's not a point mass. So that answer on number five should be around 0.25, okay? Because if that's wrong, everything else on that problem is going to be wrong. Okay, so that should be 0.25. So visualize this. Here's this solid cylinder, right? And maybe you've tied a string around it, or maybe you're just grabbing the side of it or doing something, but you're applying a force of 8 newtons tangentially to that. So obviously this thing is going to accelerate. So when you get to number 7, here's what you cannot do. Okay? Listen to me. Here's what you cannot do on number seven, because you want to find angular acceleration. So you cannot do this. You can't take force and divide that by mass and get the linear acceleration, and then use A equals R alpha to get your angular acceleration. No horrible stop, bad, no. Okay? Pussy. <laughs> Mags? Are you erasing? Maybe. Maybe? Hey, it's okay, I did that too. Hey, okay. baby, it's okay, I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you all yesterday? I know, but I was what like, did I tell you I was all like, yesterday? Man. What did I tell you yesterday? <laughs>
What did I tell you yesterday? No, it's F equals M A. F equals M A. What did you do? I did that. I actually didn't use F equals M A. And here's the reason why, beyond the fact that I yelled and screamed and told you not to, is because if I apply that force here, I get a certain acceleration. If I apply that same force out here, I get a, I get a completely different acceleration, okay? So the only time you can use F equals MA with the bicycle is if I'm gonna throw it. It's like, thanks, okay? It's the only time I could use F equals MA. You cannot use it on something that spins. But what you can do is that you can realize that torque equals two things. It equals force times radius, and it equals I alpha. That's what you can do, okay? That's what you want to do. So on that angular acceleration, you found the torque. That's your answer to number six. You found your moment of inertia. That's an answer to number five. Solve for alpha. So your answer to number seven should be, this is an ish, something around your age. Okay? It's an ish, but it's going to be something around there. Since this all kind of builds off of each other, when you get down to number 10, that angular displacement, number of radians, should be around 800. Because that all kind of builds off of each other. So when you get down to number 10, you should have her answer around 800. Everybody cool on the front page? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, let's talk about number 12. Yes. Okay? So there are certain great conservation laws in science. Okay? <coughs> One of them is the conservation of mass, which says mass cannot be cratered or destroyed. The whole, that's the whole basis of balance equations in Chem 1, okay? Law of conservation of mass. You can have the law of conservation of linear momentum, okay? Some of the momentum before has to equal the momentum after. You can also have the law of conservation of angular momentum, okay? Which is the same thing. Angular momentum cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. So here's the basic idea. So this is what we showed yesterday. So, we had Kaylee up here, and she initially had her arms outstretched, and she was on the green spinny thing, okay? So, when your arms are outstretched, were you spinning slowly or fast? Slow. Slow, because L equals I omega. So, when her arms are outstretched, what do you know about her radius? It's big. So she has a big eye, so she's going to spin slowly. Now, when you brought your arms in like a speed skater, okay, somebody figured that out, like a speed skater, or if you've ever seen gymnastics, or if you've ever seen people that are in di that dive, okay? So if someone's diving and they're in a tuck position, they're going to spin really, really rapidly, okay? But if they want to slow down, they'll open up their body, and extend their arms, and then that will make that will slow down their rate of spin. So when she brought her arms in, the eye became smaller. So to compensate, she had to spin faster. Faster. Okay? Because the angular momentum has to be conserved. Okay? Got that. Okay. Uh, now, let's talk about number 16. I promise you there's going to be one like number 16 on the test tomorrow. You mark my words, okay? 16 and 17, there's going to be one. If you hand in that test tomorrow and you haven't done conservation of angular momentum, you have done something horribly wrong, okay? I promise you there's going to be one like this. So the first thing that you want to do on 16 is just calculate the value of angular momentum. You got radians per, or revolutions per minute, because you got to change into radians per second. And then you need to calculate that moment of inertia. So your answer to number 16 would make a really, really, really good GPA times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay? A really, really good weighted GPA. 
okay, times 10 to the negative fifth. So what that means is that when that ball is spinning like this, okay, that's how much angular momentum that it has. So your answer to number 16 is something times 10 to the negative fifth. Make sure that you have the correct units of kilograms meters squared per second. Okay, it's a jacked up units. There's no cool way to put that. It's just, that's what it is. Now, here's the bigger idea on number 17. Okay, here's the bigger idea. So here's this spinning ball, and a bug is going to come and land on it. Angular momentum has to be conserved, just like linear momentum has to be conserved. So these all start the same way. I've got two things. I've got a ball, I've got a bug. So L of the bug plus L of the ball has to equal new L of the bug plus new L of the ball. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Let's start the same way. There was a third thing. I put a third thing in there. There's only two. Now, initially, is the bug part of the system? No. no. Don't have to worry about that. Bugs over doing bug things. Okay? Now, you already have the initial angular momentum of the ball. Don't recalculate it. You have it. You already found it. Okay? That is your answer to number 16. So that's how much angular momentum there has to be in the system. Okay? That's it. So these two values over here have to add up to that answer that you have for number 16. Okay? Angular momentum cannot be created or destroyed. That's it. Boom, there you go. Now, here's the deal. Are the bug and the ball when it and the bug lands or the ball lands on the bug? <coughs> Are they both going to spin at the same rate? Yeah, okay. The bugs are going to be landing on the ball and it's going to be spinning at the same rate. So because they're spinning at the same rate, what can you do on that side of the, on the right side of the equation? Factor out yeah. omega. You can factor out the omega that you're trying to find, okay? So what you could do, because it's just like a California problem, you factor out the velocity, whether it's a linear or an angular momentum. It doesn't make any difference. So this is going to be I of the ball plus I of the buck. Now, the I of the ball is still the same thing from up above. Okay? That I of that ball is still two-thirds mR squared. So if you calculated that separately, up above, just use that same number. You don't need to. You don't need to find it again. It's still the same value. Okay, there's no need to calculate it again if you, if you have it as a separate value. Okay. Now, with the eye of the bug, okay, the bug is going to be treated as a point mass. Okay, because that bug is going to land on that ball and it's going to spin around like this. Okay, so the eye of the bug is is going to be m r squared. You got the mass of the bug, and you're going to use the outside radius of the ball because that's where the ball landed. Oh, okay, cool. That was going to be the radius. Now, here's the deal. If you do that conversion correctly on 16, that's spinning at 3.14 radians per second. Okay? That's what you should, you should have as your omega on 16. It's 3.14 radians per second. Pi radians per second. So when you find that new rate of spin, is it going to be faster or slower than 3.14? Slower. Slower. Okay? It has to be slower. So your answer to number 17 has to be less than 3.14. Otherwise, you've created angular momentum. Okay? Got that. Good. Fantastic. I promise you, tomorrow, make sure you understand 16 and 17. It is going to be one like it. Okay? Just tell me. All right. Now, let's talk about number 18. So, in 18, we're going to try and find the angular momentum of the moon 
as it goes around the earth. Okay? Now, we're not trying, there, there's two, the moment of inertia of the moon, there's actually two values. There's the moment of inertia of the moon as it spins on its axis. So it, that has a moment of inertia just as it spins on its axis. But you don't have enough information to have that because you don't know the radius of the moon. Okay, so that's not what I'm asking you to find. I'm not trying to ask you to find the moment of inertia of the moon as it spins on its axis. I'm asking you to find the angular momentum of the moon as it goes around this strange rock that we're on. Okay? So, because it's a point mass, you're going to use L equals I omega. And because it's a point mass, that's going to be mr squared. Okay? You've got the mass of the moon, you've got the radius, you have enough to calculate the moment of inertia. So it's a simpler type idea of me swinging this thing around over my head. So if I wanted to calculate the moment of inertia of this point mass, I'd have to have the mass of the stopper and I'd have to have the radius. Knowing those two values, I could calculate the moment of inertia. Now, I spin it slower or I spin it faster. And what does that do to the moment of inertia as I change the speed of the rubber stopper? Absolutely nothing. But what does it change? The angular velocity. Or changes my angular velocity, therefore it changes my angular momentum, right? So when is it going to have more angular momentum? Going fast or slow? Faster, because it's going just like any momentum. The faster you go, the more momentum that you're going to have. So, the trick here is that you have to find omega. But, here's the deal. As the moon goes around our rock, how many radians does it move through? Two pi. Two pi makes one revolution, right? So, it travels through two pi <coughs> radians. Now, how long does that take? 27.3 days, okay? So you're going to take two pi radians, divide that by 27.3 days. But can you leave it in days? Mm -mm. No. It's got to be radians per second. <laughs> so if all goes well, your moment of the angular momentum on number 18 should be something times 10 to the 34th. Which is a pretty big number. Why is it so big? That kind of just doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. Well, it's a really big rock <laughs> moving pretty fast. I know, but it's like... Never mind. That makes sense. It's in meters, not radians. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. That, I was like, oh, now, weird. if you want to hold on to this assignment and hand it in tomorrow with the test, you can. If you're done with it and you want to hand it in, that's cool too. Is there right? a problem like that on the review? On which one? Like 16 and 17? I don't remember. Okay, I'll keep it. <laughs> but I know there's one on the test like it. How about that? <laughs> I promise you that. Okay, so stop you off the camera. Let's go back to them for a second. Okay, so. Here's what we've got. So, Nikki B's got a cart and a 500 gram mass. I just have a cart, okay? But there's a 50 gram mass tied to the end of each string, okay? Same force is going to be applied to the system. 50 grams, 0.05 kilograms, 0.49 newtons, okay? So both carts are going to have the exact same force applied to them. So when I let go, what's going to happen? It's going to accelerate, right? Is the momentum going to change? Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe there was hesitation. Yes. Okay. I don't know. 
It's a trick question. <laughs> Maybe the math decreases and you have I need my formula math. sheet. Okay. So I let go, I change the momentum, right? Nick lets go, his momentum changes, right? Okay. So which one is going to have the bigger acceleration? My cart or let go of yours? Nick's car. Your cart. What? His has bigger mass inertia. Wait, was it what point moment of inertia? Because yeah. it has nothing to do with moment of inertia. Lower mass. Oh. Hmm. Smaller mass, same force. Same force, right? Okay. F equals M A. Heard of that? Really? You never taught us that. Okay. So same force. I have less mass, therefore I get greater acceleration. Nick has more mass, less acceleration. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let go. Okay. And I'm gonna go like thousand one, thousand two, and then we're gonna stop the cards. Okay. So we're gonna let go at the same time. Okay, you ready? Focus. All right. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's put them all the way back here. Okay, like this. Okay, you ready? We're going to go that? three, two, one, go. Thousand, one, thousand, two, and then we're going to stop it. Okay. Okay, you ready? Just choreograph. Okay. okay. Ready? Three, <coughs> two, one, go. Thousand, one, thousand, two. Uh, this is the okay. one, Nick. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which cart underwent the greater change in momentum? My cart, Nick's cart, or was it the same? It's the same. Why? Force times time equals what? Change in momentum. Change in momentum. Was it the same force acting over the same period of time? Yeah. Yes. Now, whose cart was going faster? Yes. What? Less mass. Less mass. But they have the same momentum. Good with that. Mm -hmm. So to have the same momentum, because momentum is, our final momentums are the same. I have less mass, therefore mine has to be going faster. But, I'm gonna have, but they're both going to end up with the same momentum, because it's the same force acting over the same period of time. Okay, now, hold back. Now, this one we're going to let go of it. But we're going to put your finger, we're going to stop them at the same distance, okay? It's about like it, okay? All right, so you ready? Mm -hmm. Three, two, one, go. Now, which one underwent the greater change in the momentum? Mine, Nick's, or was it the same? Nick's. Why Nick's? More time. Same force, more time, greater change in his momentum. To get closer distance. Oh. Gracie, you okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're kind of like, woo -hoo. Okay, All right? So this is what you focus on. If you look at that equation, force times time equals change in momentum. The mass of what's being pulled isn't part of that equation. All it is is force times time. I could put an elephant on top of Nick's. As long as it's the same force acting over the same period of time, it's still going to have the same change in the momentum. Got it? Okay. Back we go. Hold that. We kind of start at the beginning. What does the area of a force time graph give you? Momentum. Not momentum. Change in momentum. Change in momentum. Change in momentum. Big difference. Okay? Because remember, that's going to be your net force. Not your force. It's going to be your net force. So, uh, if you have a force time graph, that area is going to equal change in the momentum, right? Now, <coughs> so if you look at what we just did, we have the same force, point, in that case it was 0.49 newtons, and that was 2 seconds. So that change in momentum would be 0.98 newton seconds, okay? There's your change of momentum. It's the area underneath that graph. Now, if you look at a graph of momentum versus time, okay? So look at a graph of momentum versus time. Both, both cards started at zero. True? Because both cars are at rest. 
We let go after two seconds. They ended up here at 0.98 Newton seconds. So if you have a momentum time graph that's sloping, okay, if you have a momentum time graph that's sloping, what does the slope of a momentum time graph give you? Newton second squared. Force. Why? Because the forces are the same, so I was just making an educated guess. Okay. Well, what units is new? What you? What units is momentum measured in? Newton seconds, right? Oh, seconds. True. True. So if I were to find this slope, right? Yeah. That'd be change in y over. Which would be 0.98 newton seconds divided by two seconds. The seconds cancel out. I get newtons. So what does the slope of a momentum time graph give you? Force. Okay, and that's the force that's causing an acceleration. Now let's say, let's say. We keep the same carts, okay? But instead of putting a small little 0.5 kilogram mass on there, I put a 500 gram mass on the end, okay? What's gonna happen to the slope of my momentum time graph? Really? So it's still going to take exactly two seconds to get a momentum of 0.98 newton seconds. If I put a 500 gram mass on the end of it, it's still going to take two seconds to get to that momentum. No. Yes. Yes. No. 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 I thought you said mass doesn't matter. But no, this is. But oh, what, but I'm changing the force, the force that's being applied. Oh. I'm putting a 500 gram mass on the end of the so, string. Okay, yeah. So All the right? force that's applied is what matters? <coughs> yes. With the mass? Oh, on the end of the string. I yes, on, on the end, the end the of the string. Oh, oops. On the end of the string. That's my bad. They're showing you the picture. On the end of the string. So, what is a 500 gram, what's the weight of a 500 gram mass? Like 4 point 0.5 something. times 9.8 9 .8. 9 .8 gets you 4.9. So wouldn't the slope of that line become much steeper? No. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it would take a lot less time to get to that same momentum because there would be more force. Okay? That's what you want to think through. Now, let's talk about, remember when I threw that egg to Wyatt? Why it caught the egg? Why did he move his hands in the direction of the egg? Why? Why did you do that? To decrease force, to increase time, or decrease the change in the momentum? To increase time. Increase time. But by increasing time, what else did you get as a, as a benefit of that? Change in momentum. Wait. <clears throat> Not change in momentum. Let me give you a hint. It rhymes with eight of change in momentum. Rate of change in momentum. Rate of change in momentum. Okay. So when he caught it, he was trying to decrease the rate of the change in the momentum. So remember, when Wyatt caught that egg, that egg came in with a certain amount of momentum. So out when he cradled it, he was trying to make that line more shallow. Now go back to this. This is a momentum time graph, right? So the slope of a momentum time graph gives you force. force. So by having it cradled, he increased the time. So here's the most common misconception. Oh, you cradled it so you decreased the change in the momentum. Why is that not true? Because yeah, no matter how he catches it, okay? The final momentum of the egg is still going to be zero. By cradling it, he's trying to increase the time. 
by increasing the time, you decrease the force. Okay? So this decreases the change in momentum per unit of time. It doesn't decrease the change in the momentum. Now, if he, he goes, oh, upper camp, I'm going to live on the edge. I'm just going to catch it like this. I'm not going to cradle it. I'm going to live it on the edge, right? I'm a rebel, right? So if he catches it by not cradling it, what's, it, what's that going to do to the change in the momentum? Absolutely nothing. Final momentum of the egg is still going to be zero. But what's, what's it going to do to the slope of that line? Make it Did you just say it was going to make it less steep? <laughs> no, it's much more steeper. He's less. Oh, he said much less. He said much less. I said less. Yep. He did not say less. Said less. Yeah, I think he, he did. Less. I'm sitting right next to him. We have a TV. video. We can play Yeah, we can play this back. <laughs> yep. Film Matt, 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 Okay, somebody throw the challenge flag. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to throw the red no, challenge flag. No. I think that's what you said. That's why I was confused. I meant more steeper. That's on me. More steeper. <laughs> okay. Something like this? Like that, yeah. Okay? Maybe now, in both situations, is the yes. final momentum of the A going to be zero? Yes. 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 Okay. Now, force time graph, area on the force time graph represents change in momentum. So here are the two options. Why it could either have a small force acting over A long time or he could have a small force or a large force acting over a uh, small amount of time. In both situations, the area would be the same, right? Right. So when you, every time you drive your car, you don't know it, but every time you drive your car, you are making a decision about what that force time graph is going to look like when you drive your car, okay? You don't know it, but you do. So let's say you're at a stoplight, right? light turns green. When you press down on the gas pedal, depending on how hard you press down on the gas pedal, what are you changing? The momentum or the rate of change in the momentum? It's the rate of change in the momentum. So let's say you need to go from zero to 40 miles per hour. Situation number one, you romp out and go, okay? Right? You're going to go to zero to 40, but you're going to go there really quickly. Situation number two, you go from zero to 40 and you just barely press down on the gas pedal. Okay? Like there's a, you, there's a turtle that is outrunning you. Okay? Grandma. Okay? Right? You're driving really, you, you can get to 40, but it's going to take you a long time. Right? So, same thing is true when you hit the brakes. When you hit the brakes, you are fundamentally deciding the rate of change in your momentum. Now listen to me very carefully. You want a big change in momentum. You want to change the momentum in your car a lot. Big, 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 huge change in momentum. Okay? Small force, long time. Big force, small time. Big force, big time. Small force, small time. What will create the biggest change in the momentum? Big force, big force small time. What would you say? Big force. Big force. No, big force, big time. Why big force, big time? Yeah. Why big force, big time? Biggest area. It's the biggest area. If you want to create the biggest possible change in momentum, you're going to press down on that gas pedal and you're going to hold it there for a long time. Because that's going to create the biggest <coughs> area. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool with that. Okay. So I promise you there's going to be like linear momentum problems. You're going to have like some car that might be at rest. And then another car is going to move and it's going to hit it. And they might move off together. So if it's a California problem, let's say that this is, has mass M, 
And this is also has car mass m, but it's moving at velocity v. So here's what I want you to think through. And you see, you're going to hate this. Like, oh, Mr. Brick, if there's no numbers, you are so mean. It's okay. So you have a cart with mass m that's at rest. A cart with mass m, identical mass, moving with velocity v, runs into said cart. The two carts join together and they move off. What's the new velocity of the system? V or one half V or one fourth V? What's the new velocity of the system after they move off together? One half V? Maybe. One half V or not to one half V? I think so. Maggie, what are you what are you yesing to? I think it's one half V. Why do you think it's one half V? I think you're right, but tell me why why I think you're right. It's double the mass. And to have the same momentum you have to have the same and it has to be equal to the velocity it was in the beginning. Like it has to, you know, it has to like equal half the velocity of the end. Okay, let, let, let's, let's put this into a mathematical situation, okay? <laughs> momentum of 1 plus the momentum of 2 has to equal the new momentum of 1 plus the new momentum of 2. True? True. Cool with that. Everybody cool with that idea? Yeah. Cart 2 is at rest. It has no momentum. So this is just going to be M, V, Right? Don't know what the numbers are, don't care what the numbers are. That's just the momentum, mass times the velocity, right? Now, because they move off together, what can you do over here? Combine. M plus M. times M. V prime. Now, check my math, but if I take M plus M, I get 2M. 2M. So to make this equal, what has to happen to my velocity? It has to be half as much. Yes. Okay? Seem reasonable. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Now, what if the cart that's moving just comes to a complete stop? It just stops. What do you know about the new velocity of the other one? It has to be why? Because love conservation of of uh, Rhymes with momentum. Yeah, momentum. Momentum, thank you very much. Okay, law of conservation of momentum, right? Yeah. So if one stops, the other one has to have that exact same amount of momentum. momentum. Got that. Cool. Okay. All right, so let's talk angular motion. So you're going to have these equations that are on your sheet. D equals R theta. V equals R Omega A equals R fish. Okay, you have them. Okay, you just have to know how to use them. So here might be a situation. Let's say that I tell you that this wheel is moving at a certain linear velocity. Okay, so let's say that it's moving at 10 meters per second and it has a radius of. 0.25 meters. So this whole thing is moving down the road, whoop, 10 meters per second. Okay? That's what it's moving. Down. What could you find? What do you say? What? But. But. How? Yeah. yeah. So if V equals R omega, right? So if I take the 10 meters per second, <coughs> and divide that by 0.25 meters. First off, what's going to happen to the meters? Cancel out. They're going to cancel out. Now, this is this radians or this nebulous kind of thing, okay? 10 divided by 0.25 is going to be what? 40. 40? 40, and then your units are like per second. But this is where the radians kind of float back in. That's why I said the this nebulous thing, they're there, but they're not there. So that's going to be 40 radians per second. Okay? Got that. Now, 
Here's this wheel spinning at 40 radians per second. Is 40 radians per second the same on the outside as it is on the inside? No. Wait, I thought so. Hold on. Yeah. Wheel was spinning at yes. 40 radians per second. Mm -hmm. Is every point on here moving at 40 radians per second? Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. But does every point on there have the same linear velocity? No. No. So when you see that 10 meters per second, I'm going to either tell you it's the tangential velocity or the linear velocity. That is dependent upon radius because the points closer to the circle, they aren't moving as fast in terms of meters per second as the points on the outside. This is why if you've ever been to a track meet, okay, they stagger the starts. Why? Because they have different actual distances. They have different, well, they're going to travel the same distance, but if uh, you're running yeah. in a, in a, like this, and you start everybody at the same point, Mags, you know a little bit about track. If you line everybody up in a line, going into a curve, is everybody going to travel the same distance? No. Who's going to travel the longest distance? So if you did this, guaranteed, if everybody's running at the same speed, who's going to win? The person on the inside. Why? Because they have the shortest distance to travel. Okay. So if you line me up, heck, I might even win if like, you do that. You put me on the inside like, Brooke Hill's in a wheelchair, but he's got a shorter distance. He might win. Okay. All right. So you have to realize when radius is a factor and when radius is not a factor. Okay, so speaking of when, so what are some things that are factors that might affect the angular acceleration of this wheel? What are some things that will affect the angular acceleration of that wheel? Uh, torque. <coughs> is torque one of them? Angular velocity. No. What would it be? You said angular acceleration? What are some things that will affect the angular acceleration of the spinning wheel? Radius. Radius, radius of what? The, the mass. The radius of the wheel or the radius of where I applied the force? Um, or force. both? Both. Both. Yeah, because yeah, force and radius. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so force times radius gets you what? Torque. Don't make me flex, I'll rip my shirt. Okay. I times. It's, it's, that wasn't that funny. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> force times radius determines what? Torque. Torque, torque. right? So force times radius equals torque. So if I apply that force really close to the inside, is that going to generate much torque? No. No. But if I apply that same force out on the outside, I'm going to create a... Thanks, you okay? That's always awkward. Did you get like the dribble water bottle? What? Is that like the dribble glass? It's a baby bottle. Oh, really? That's awkward. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, where I apply the force and how much force I apply are going to determine the torque. Now, where does the distribution of the mass play a factor? Moment of inertia. Because um, torque also equals... Oh, crap. I fish. But hidden within the I is what? Um, MR. MR squared. MR squared. <laughs> so, the... That radius, in terms of the distribution of the mass, alters that. So let's say you have two objects. You have Lord of the Rings, and you have a solid disk. If I apply the same torque to them, this is huge if. If I apply the same torque, which one will accelerate faster? The solid disk. The solid disk, why? <clears throat> Nope. Smaller moment of inertia. Right? Smaller moment of inertia. Because the Lord of the Rings has all that mass concentrated toward the outside. 
that's like this, okay? This one is going to be more like, the disc would be more like this, okay? This would be like the Lord of the Rings, okay? Very tough to get moving, but once you get it moving, it is tough to stop it. Okay. So, when you talk about radius, you have to be very careful. Are you talking about the radius in terms of where the mass is located, or are you talking about radius in terms of where the force is going to be applied? Okay? Because one affects torque, the other one affects the moment of inertia. So be very careful about that idea. Okay. Uh, let me see. Hockey puck slides along and it runs into an octopus that was thrown onto the ice. Okay? Hockey puck has a mass of 0.1 kilograms. The octopus has a mass of 10 kilograms. They hit, they move off together. Okay? Which one will undergo the greater... Which, let me ask you this. Which one will, ex will experience the greater force? The hockey puck or the octopus? Or is it the same? the same? Why is it the same? They have different masses. What's Newton's third law? For every action, there is a? Now, does, does there, are there any <coughs> contingencies upon mass? No. No. Okay? This is Newton's law. This is not Newton's, well, I don't know, maybe, a little wishy-washy, okay? No, it's a law, okay? It is a law, which means it's invariant. Which one will, under, will the hockey puck undergo a change in momentum? Yes. 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 Yeah. Will the octopus undergo a change in momentum? Yes. Yeah. Which one will undergo a greater change in momentum? The hockey puck or the octopus? Or is it the same? It's the same. Why? The law of conservation of momentum. It isn't the suggestion of momentum, okay? It's a law. So whatever momentum is lost by the octopus is gained by the, or excuse me, whatever momentum is lost by the hockey puck is gained by the octopus. octopus. 0.1 kilogram, 10 kilogram. Which one will undergo a greater acceleration? The hockey puck, the octopus, or is it the same? I think it's the, the hockey puck. The hockey puck. Why? Same force. Same force, right? Force equals? We've talked about this just once or twice. Okay? So, the hockey puck has a? So it's going to have a? Bigger change in velocity. The octopus has a? So it's going to have a smaller acceleration. Forces always equal and opposite. Changes in momentum equal and opposite. Accelerations, not so much. What's well, the only way your accelerations would be equal and opposite? The mass is going to be the same. Okay? Here's the problem I promise you will be on the test. It's that one where you drop the ball and it bounces. Okay? I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, it was going to be on the second to the last page, okay? It's that big one that we worked, I'm telling you, you're going to draw a velocity time graph, you are not going to be expected to know the exact times, but you're going to know the shape of them, okay? We worked it in class, there was one like this on the review, okay? The only thing I can do differently is change the numbers. The parameters are going to be the same. Anything going down is going to be positive. Anything excuse me, is negative. Anything going up is going to be positive. Okay? And I'm going to look for that change in the momentum when it's in contact with the Earth. Okay? So I promise you, it's going to be the... You work that problem again and again and again. Create... 
a Google Doc. Do whatever you all do to communicate. Smoke, smoke signals, whatever. Has someone come up with a problem? You know, hey, we'll, we'll set up a problem. Work it. Make sure that you can understand it. Because you know the problem is coming. It's going to be there. Okay? I promise you. The only thing I can change is the mass of the ball, the initial height, the final height, and how long it's in contact with the ground. Let's see. Those are the only things that I can change. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be a jerk and go. Oh, no, on the test I went down to be positive. I went up to be negative. Okay. No. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to play out. So remember, this graph is going to look something like this. Okay. Falls, boom, <coughs> hits the ground, bounces up, leaves. What is going to be the slope of those two segments right there? Negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Why? Because that's the only force acting on it. Okay? So it slows, so it, I, it falls, and it is speeding up, right? Hits the ground, and it is slowing down. Then it is speeding back up, and then it is slowing back down. So you spend half, you spend part of the time slowing down, you spend, you spend part of it speeding up. The trickiest part is when you look at change in momentum, which is mass times V minus V naught. Okay? This is the change in the momentum when it's in contact with the ground. So V naught, the ball is going to be going in which direction when it hits the ground? Down. Down. So that's going to have a negative velocity, right? When it leaves, it's going to leave with a positive. So your change in the velocity is going to be some positive velocity minus some negative velocity. Okay? That has to be your signs. Okay? Those have to be your signs. And you're going to use that equation twice. But remember, the V here becomes the V naught there. The V naught here becomes the V there. That's the switch that you have to think through, okay? That's the most vital switch. And I'll tell you right now, I'm going to go through that problem with a fine-tooth comb. I better see everything underneath that radical. You better consistently be using negative 9.8 meters per second squared. You better consistently be defining your displacements in terms of being positive negatives, because otherwise I'm going to snarkly write, wow, really, you have a negative underneath the radical. Imaginary velocity, cool, okay? I'll snarkily write it. I won't enjoy it. Actually, yes, I will. So it's like, really? 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 You went over this. Okay. I'm done. And the rest, I'll give you the review. Okay? And on the review, if you do nothing else, okay, here is number 14. That's that ball drop problem. Okay? So if nothing else, you make sure that you can work number 14, okay? And then you work it again and again and again. So, all right, kids, here we go. So stop, you on camera?